Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 111, which reads as follows. Yoja vasa satang jive dupanyo asamahito ekahang jivitang seyo panyavantasa jaino which means uh, if one should live a hundred years with without wisdom of little understanding uh, and unfocused unconcentrated ekahang jivitang seyo better it is to live better is the one is the is a life Better is a life of one day for one who is wise and meditates. Very similar to our last verse. As I said, we're going to have a series of these, and so we'll probably go through them quite quickly. The story for this one also is quite short. So here we have a story about Kondanya, but it's a, a monk named Kondanya, uh, not Maha Kondanya, Maha Kondanya, the Kondanya that many Buddhists are familiar with. This one is Karnu Kondanya, Karnu, and Karnu means stump. So he was Kondanya of the stump. He was an arahant, and he was dwelling in the forest, and. He lived alone for much of the time and uh, he became an arahant while he was in the forest and he was on his way back to talk to the Buddha, to let the Buddha know that he had become an arahant. And on his way back he became tired and so he stopped and sat down on a rock and went, entered into a meditative uh, state. Maybe he entered into Nibbana, maybe just a jhana. Probably he entered into a cessation, a state of, of uh, attainment of Nibbana. We call palasamapati, when someone who has become a sotapana, sakatagami, anagami, or narahant, they can enter into a, a state of reviewing uh, Nibbana, going over the path that they have attained. Not the path, going over the fruition that they have attained. And so they enter into cessation for 10 minutes, 1 hour, 10 hours, 24 hours. And uh, during that time, they, they, it's, it's um, complete cessation. So they, they, they are completely oblivious to the world around them. Completely oblivious. There is no... Uh, no seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, or thinking. No, no even sense of time passing. It seems as though that time is just missing, except there's a huge sense of peace that it lasts even after the person co comes out of the state. And uh, so during that time, he would have gone in for maybe a day, uh, 24 hours or something. And during that time, a group of Bandits, a large group of bandits, similar to in our last story. Uh, but these guys had plundered a whole village. They had destroyed and robbed an entire village. And gone in with their guns. No, they didn't have guns with their bows and arrows and their swords and killed and raped and pillaged and or maybe just robbed. Because they don't seem to have been all that all that evil. They, so they came up and, and it was getting dark and so they wanted to rest as well and seeing this flat rock that the elder had sat on, they saw this rock and they saw the elder but it was getting dark and so they, they thought he was a tree stump and uh, so the, the, head, the head bandit took his, uh, um, his sack with all his, uh, all his valuables that he had robbed and actually placed it on the, on the elder's head and just plopped it down on top of him, or maybe on his shoulders or something, just over top of him. 
and the other robbers piled up their their sacks around the original one, around the stump, sort of covering the the monk completely, and burying him in their sacks. So there were five hundred uh, uh, bandits, or a large number, probably. And usually, you think five hundred might be a bit of an exaggeration for one band of bandits, but. A lot is the idea, and um, and then they slept and spent the night. And the elders spent the night completely oblivious as to what was going on. In the morning, they wake up, light out, and they start to take the sacks off one by one. And the the, the, the chief picks up his sack, or as they get close, they see it's not a stump, and he pulls his sack off, and it's a monk sitting in meditation completely unmoved, you know, stiff and un, unaffected. And they were spooked, and they thought it was some kind of evil spirit, and so they started to run away. And at that moment, the elder came out of the attainment, and so he turned and looked at them, and he said, Oh, don't be afraid, I'm, I'm a monk. I'm, I'm, not here to <laughs> I'm not here to curse you. And they were... Uh, they were shocked and, and moved, you know, reasonably so, seeing um, some obviously an incredibly powerful meditator who was who spent the whole night covered in, in sacks full of heavy valuables. Again, it, it speaks to this the power of the attainment. There's this idea of the power of, of true meditative attainment uh, makes one invincible. You know, I mentioned this uh, Tibetan monks who supposedly go into trances and then they, they, they go and sit in snowbanks and uh, they go into trances and maybe the fire element and they actually melt all the snow around them and they have contests to see who can melt the most snow. I don't know, this is what I've heard. But there's lots of fun things that supposedly happen and if you want, you can, if you want to test, you can meditate for yourself and see what sort of things occur. You know, a lot of people experience ast what we call astral travel. Some people uh, are able to see things far away, hear things far away. Some people are able to remember past lives. Some people can see into the future. Very strange things can happen when you meditate. Of course, it's not the goal. It's not why we meditate. But Anyway, here we have this idea of being somehow in invincible when you enter into these states, physically invincible covered in, in heavy, heavy things and not being disturbed. And so they were, they were suitably impressed and um, made up their minds to, to become monks. They, they said, to, the head, head, head uh, bandit said, I'm going to become a monk under that. I'm going to become a, a follower of this guy because he's got the power. Here we thought we were powerful. You know, uh, we have this power over people, making them afraid and um, being able to take their, their belongings from them. But, but that's not real power, not compared to this guy. Clearly he has far more power than us. And so they became monks. And so he made monks of them all, just as Sankicca had done. And he went with them to the teacher. And when they got to the Buddha, the Buddha noticed and said, Oh, Kondanya, you've got some students with you, have you? And Kondanya told them what had happened. And the, the Buddha looks at the, looked at the monks and he said, Is this truly what happened? And the guys were like, Well, yeah. Is it true? We're a bunch of, rob bunch of bandits. Mm, well, yeah, you know. And the Buddha shook his head and said, better for you to live one moment better for you to live but a single day meditating, being wild, you know, engaged in things that are truly to your benefit that truly bring happiness to you and to your mind that truly bring good things better to live one day like that than to live a hundred years evil and, and committing such foolishness as you've been in, engaged in 
and so he um, made a connection made, made the connection to the Dhamma they say that's what these stories at the end it always says he, he he connected it with the Dhamma whatever the situation was he points out the Dhamma in regards to the situation and as a result having made the connection he spoke this verse Yoja Vasasatang Jive and so on so a short story this time and a verse very similar to our last one there's not that much to say the difference here is whereas the last one was the last one is in, was in regards to morality Dusilo. Uh, this one is in regards to wisdom in fact it's interesting because the three things go together these two verses point out um, both sides of it. So concentration is is the defining factor here, but you have wisdom on the one hand and morality on the other, and these three make up the three trainings of the Buddha. Together they they describe the Buddha's teaching, they describe the Eightfold Noble Path, so they are the path of practice. You s one way of explaining it is you start with morality and you become focused as a result of being ethical, your mind becomes focused because you 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 cease in engaging in things that distract your mind or disturb the mind. And once your mind is focused, in focus, then you can see clearly. And that's wisdom. So these three go together. So it's it's rhetoric. You don't have to pick either or. The Buddha isn't saying either you can do concentration in wisdom or you can do concentration in morality. He's just talking about good things, and he's, he's, he's addressing a, a group of people who, um, who could best ap appreciate um, certain aspects of the teaching. So in, for some people, uh, ethics is more important, more interesting, and more applicable. For some people, wisdom will be more applicable. So these verses are, are tuned to their uh, audience, usually. And probably in this case, after he desana wasane, all fi at the at the end of his teaching, all five hundred of the bhikkhus became arahants. Uh, isn't that isn't that awesome? It'd be nice if that sort of thing happened these days. After teaching about the dhamma, we all became arahants. But you can't blame the dhamma; you have to blame yourself. That our minds are so clouded that it takes much more than just the simple teaching. But there's something to this idea that simple teachings can lead to enlightenment, because the truth is not hard to understand. It's, um, it's actually quite easy, and once you've understood it, it's almost as though you don't know how you can miss it. You know, for the most part, we are clear about um, reality, it's just we add on so much more, or we take a, or we ignore certain things. Like for example, talking about free will and determinism, we if it's about free will, then we add a soul into the equation. If we believe in determinism, then we we ignore the mind, we ignore the the choice. The, the, uh, we ignore the, the, the first person nature of reality. Well, maybe we think of it as, as just physical. If uh, when when we are addicted to something, we tend we tend to know that the addiction is causing us suffering, and yet we don't stop. You know? we're like we're like insane people. Um, when we're angry, when we're angry at someone, we you make me so angry, as though. When someone makes us angry, we, we, you make me so angry as though we're blaming them for our own suffering. Because we're suffering. When we're angry, we suffer. We blame. And so the teaching is, is actually quite simple. If you receive these simple teachings and you, you uh, become in tune with them, you know, if you're hearing it from the Buddha, it's, it's strong enough to jar you out of your state and, and, and really 
bring you in, in line with this this truth so forceful and so confidently delivered by someone who is so pure and so perfect that it really changes you there's somehow kind of a magic in, in teaching in that way when you're taught and when, when it when it's delivered with confidence, you know, the confidence of the Buddha, the power of the Buddha. So there's that. We're to blame for not being born in the time of the Buddha and uh, having actually listened to him, and instead you have to listen to me. But the Dhamma remains the same, and the path is still there. It just might be more difficult of a climb, more difficult of a path. If we don't walk it, then we can be sure to fail. If we practice, we can't be sure if and when we'll succeed, but if we don't practice, we can be sure that we will fail. So there's that. Anyway, that's the Dhammapada teaching for tonight, that we should be wise and meditate. If we practice these two things together, not just meditating, not just focusing our minds, but also uh, cultivating wisdom. Again, not just being concerned with wisdom without meditating and thinking that we know everything, studying and, and thinking and so on, but actually coming to see for ourselves. And when we meditate, this is what we see. We, this is what happens. We see impermanence, we see suffering, we see non-self. We see through our delusions of stability, uh, satisfaction and control or self, and we've come to see that things are not the way we think, they're not worth clinging to, they have nothing, no characteristic of them that, is, that makes them worth clinging to. We start to see things as being without value, without merit, uh, not, not a stable, we see that our own mind and everything in the world around us is not a stable, um, dependable refuge or platform on which to base our goals and our aspirations and our desires. And so we give them up. We give up our desire for such things. And that's the best way to live. If you live your life one day like that, it's far more valuable. It's on a whole other league from living and living well. You know, people talk about living, um, living the good life carpe diem, seize the day, eat, drink, and be merry, you know, like angels in heaven who enjoy their pleasant things up in heaven. And they think, well, that's, that's what it's all about. Right? People will say, this is what it's all about. I mean, I know I used to be there. We'd party and, and dance and sing. I remember going to dances when I was younger and everyone was so excited and so much, because there's so much chemicals in the brain. This, the adrenaline and so on, and dopamine, I don't know what kinds of chemicals uh, were involved with dancing and enjoying yourself and partying and drinking and laughing and joking and playing music and playing musical instruments and so on. And then it doesn't make you happier. You don't actually feel happier afterwards. So that kind of life is actually pointless. In the end, you finish and you die, and that was it. You be, you've, you've gained nothing. In fact, most likely you've cultivated all sorts of addiction and attachment and aversion that's going to cause you problems in this life and in the next. So there's that. Better to be mindful, better to be wise, better to be focused, better to see things as they are. So that's the Dhammapada for today. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.